This is the seventh week in a fall study series, a seven-week fall study series. How many of you have really enjoyed this study series this year? Yeah. It's been a really nice one based on the book by Dr. Uh, Roger Teal, Reverend Dr. Roger Teal of the Mile High Church in Denver, Center for Spiritual Living. This book is, the title is This Life is Joy. And he begins with seven pillars or spiritual truths. He has other things in the book, but we've really focused on Sundays on these seven pillars spiritual principles or pillars. We've had study groups that have met together and gone even deeper in some of the other ideas that he presents. But we began the first week, you may remember, with this instant is love. And then this being is light. This world is consciousness. This idea is substance. This relationship is oneness. Last week we talked about this journey is surrender. And this week, the final week, is this life is joy. So my practice is, my day off, I'm off on Monday, so Tuesday is like my Monday. It's responding to a lot of emails, different things at the church. Wednesday morning early, I, was, I began by sitting with the title, the idea. Well, you know what this past Wednesday was? And I went to sleep early Tuesday night, so I woke up to the election results, and then I sat down and said, okay, this life is joy. That's my sermon title this week. Yeah. I kind of wondered if... <laughs> kind of wondered, you know, in seminary, they always taught us, don't ever let a sermon title get in the message of a good, the way of a good talk. And so I thought, well, do we need to go back a week that this journey is surrender? And, uh, and, and some people in the first service, if you were here last Sunday, I told a story about how golf people from Britain went to um, India and wanted to play golf and made these beautiful golf courses, but they forgot one thing, there are monkeys in India. So as they began to play golf, the monkeys would grab their balls and golf balls and throw them all over the place. So they built walls, they created distractions, and nothing worked. And so eventually they created a new game called Play Ball, where the monkey drops it. <laughs> and, uh, and so I got some emails Tuesday, I mean Wednesday, that said, well, Reverend Darlene, we're going to play ball where the monkey dropped it. <laughs> I said, yeah, we're going to have a prayer service Wednesday night, too. So we, we, it's been an interesting week in, in working with this. And so joy, though, really is fitting. And we're going to talk about that and, and what it means and what really is joy. And to help us get us there, there's a question that I would ask us, I'll ask now and I'll ask again later, but that is for us to be mindful and to really begin to consider what are we carrying with us? And what do we carry within us? And I'll tell you a, a story, and you'll understand more about this in a minute, but many of you know I was the minister on Unity of Maui. I did transitional work there, and then my next ministry was going to be in the Seattle area. So I accepted the position and knew I was coming, but I didn't want to just fly over to find a place. I thought, well, I can do that online. So I looked on Craigslist, and I found a place in Gig Harbor, Washington. If any of you know the place, it's a really beautiful place found the, what looked like the perfect duplex that I would rent. And the, the owner said, you know what, just give me a deposit, and I'm so confident you'll like it. If you don't, I'll give your money back. So I gave my deposit, put my stuff on a container. It's now out in the Pacific Ocean, somewhere between Hawaii and the Pacific, um, you know, part of the coast, <laughs> Seattle area. And I arrive and go to this place. I get there late in the afternoon in Gig Harbor, and I pull up, and it's in a beautiful setting. It is a duplex, but something about it is odd. And I walk in, and nothing about it feels right for me. And the man says, yes, you know, I bought this a few years ago. It was a funeral home. <laughs> and I've converted it. Look, you know. Well, you know. I, that was okay, I guess, but nothing in me resonated with the place. And so I said, I am sorry, but, you know, I'm just, it just is not going to work for me. And he was very kind. He gave me my check, my deposit check back. So this is a Monday, and I was planning to spend the night there in my new place. I have a suitcase and a few things, and mind you, all my stuff is on the water heading to this place. So I have to call them and say, I'll give you the new address, but I don't yet know where it is. So then I went to prayer and said, God, 
you have got a problem here. <laughs> I said, yes, I have moved and I have nowhere to live. So I'm going to go into a hotel and, you know, take a few days. I'm sure I'll find something. So I call a realtor, someone that you know, has rental property. I start looking. I look all day Tuesday, didn't find anything. Look all day Wednesday, didn't find anything. Look all day Thursday. I'm like, oh, my Lord, I'm just not finding anything. So Thursday night as I go to bed, just as I turn out the light and lie down in the hotel room, I hear, look on Craigslist. And I thought, I've looked on Craigslist for, you know, three days. Besides, I found a funeral home house on Craigslist. And I <laughs> but I hear it again, and I know that voice. Look on Craigslist. I turn on the light, dig out my laptop computer, open it up, and lo and behold, a house just popped up. Somebody just listed a house in, in an area that would work for me. And so I wrote down the number. It was late then. I wrote down the number, and I set my clock. I got up early, and I called at like 7 in the morning. I talked to a gentleman and I said, is this for real? I saw this house and he said, yes, my wife and I need to move. We were planning to sell it, but it didn't sell. And so we've decided to put it on the market for, I mean, to rent it for uh, six months. And I was thinking, well, if he'll rent it for six months, he'll rent it for a year and that'll work for me. And I said, I'm coming right over to see it. So I got ready and I went over to see it. And by the time I get there, there's a couple shaking his hand, holding a piece of paper, walking out the door. I thought, oh, Lord, because just walking in, I could tell, I love it. This would be perfect. And I looked at him, and he said, well, they're going to go look at one other place. We hadn't signed anything, but they're very interested. And I said, well, please show me. So I look at this house, and it is, is exactly what I want. And in talking to him, he would have rented it for, would rent it for a year. And so now it's time for me to sell him on, on me. You need to rent. Go ahead and rent to me. Forget those other people. They, could, they, they left. They're looking at something else. You don't know about that. So I need to sell him on me. So I pulled out the minister card. <laughs> and I said, you know, you'll check. You'll run a credit check. I've got great credit. And I'm a minister. I'm coming in for Unity Church of South Sound, and so you'll always be able to find me. You know, if anything goes wrong, you're going to know who I am. And so just as I'm saying that, this noise goes off. So let me take you back to the noise. So when I went from Maui to Seattle, I, before then I went to, came to North Carolina, the eastern part of the state, to visit my family during this move. So I had just gotten back from North Carolina, and I had upgraded from a flip phone to my first iPhone. And while I was there, my niece and nephews, who of course were teenagers and already had iPhones, were teaching me all these things about it. One of the things they showed me was how you could customize your ringtone. And so I just gave them my phone and said, each of you put on a ringtone that you like, and then when it rings, it'll be your special song. I didn't think about it anymore. <laughs> until that moment in that man's home when I, when I just was saying, you know, I have good credit and I'm a minister. And he said, oh, oh, you're a minister. This loud song started singing. It kept getting, and it said, I'm going to whoop somebody's ass. <laughs> oh, I'm going to whoop somebody's ass. <laughs> but it said that part real, and I'm like, in the world set, and then I realized, oh my God, that's coming out of my phone, my purse. <laughs> and so I'm hoping he doesn't hear the ass word. And so I scrambled to get it and try to turn it off, but I, I answered it and then hung up. And so I'm just trying to ignore that it happened. <laughs> and, and we begin, continue. he said, now tell me again. So I'm trying to tell him, well, because I answered and turned it off, my nephew calls back. <laughs> I'm going to whoop somebody's, you know. Finally, I had to stop, dig it out, and say, I said, I am so embarrassed and so sorry. And it's my youngest nephew, who was 13 at the time. Uh, and I explained what I did, and I, I said, I don't know how to operate this phone, and I have no idea why he put that on there. <laughs> but I said, I have never whipped anybody's, and, and I, don't, <laughs> I don't plan to. That's not who I am. And... <laughs> And it, it just created another opening. He said, oh, so you have family. We begin to talk about family. Well, the man rented the place to me. So <laughs> God is good. And, but the thing about that, why did that come to me this week when I was meditating? 
You ever notice those kind of things come up when you're trying to meditate? But when it came up this time, I thought, how often have we taken something, somebody's given us something, how often are we carrying around stuff that's, that we don't really resonate with it? It doesn't really represent us. You hear what I'm saying? That we're carrying around and we don't even know it until something happens and it goes off. This week, this election period has been the ugliest election that any of us have ever experienced, I believe. Certainly any that I've experienced. But what we need to pause and remember is the, the ugliness, the fighting, the anger, the disrespect, the disdain, the prejudice, all of this stuff that is ringing out. It did not just get created. That stuff has been carried around inside of us collectively, lurking in the shadows, hiding just beneath the surface. And what has happened is there's been a great shaking that says it's time to come out of the shadows. You need to own your stuff. You need to be responsible. If you feel that way, then have the courage to say it in the light. And I truly believe that as a community, as a country, that we stand on the side of love, we stand on the side of inclusivity, we stand on the side of dignity and respect. And so it's easier to deal with stuff, we'd rather it go away, but when it's in people's hearts, when it's in some of our hearts and you don't even know that it's there, it needs to come to the surface to be healed. Reveal what needs to be revealed and heal what needs to be healed. And in that bizarre way, that brings me joy. Because we sure have a lot of stuff that is now no longer being hidden it's free to be put out there and now that it's put out there we can make choices and it's calling each and every one of us to get clear about what do I want to carry inside of me what do I identify with what choice will I make and what actions will I make take and so I hope that you will join me in becoming even more involved that that's what it's calling us to do amen, amen. and so when you really get that and understand that as I said that whole thing in meditation, it, it it's came back to me because it said, Darlene, are you carrying around anything else? Do you have anger? Do you have feelings of inferiority or superiority? Do you have any disregard for the earth? Do you have any places where you just care about you and yours and not the whole? You know, that's the question we're being all asked, to really look inside, open up those places within ourselves, and make choices and thereby create a country and a world that works for everyone. And I believe we are well on our way. Sometimes it gets ugly before it gets pretty, but we're well on our way. So hold on and, and know that. And in knowing that, as I said, is great joy. So this week, the last week, this journey is surrender, and today this life is joy. To me, that's a perfect paradox, if you will, for life. Because life hangs between that. It's the authentic surrendering of when I go to the end of all that I think I can do, of all that I think I am, there I come to discover the great I am. I come to discover a greater dimension of all that I am. So it's a, between the letting go and, and joy. That's really the ordinary, that's everyday life. That is where we live. So what is joy? If you were around here Friday night at that concert, that was joyful. Amen. That was just incredible. Often, though, we, we, we confuse the word joy with happiness. You see, happiness is dependent upon conditions. When things are going well, we are happy. When things are not going well, we are unhappy. We're not happy. It's up and down. It's dependent on conditions. Happiness needs things to be a certain way to be happy. When they're not a certain way, we're not happy. So happiness depends on conditions. Joy is unconditional. Joy is present in any condition. Why? Because joy is a fruit of the Spirit. You see, whether you know it or not, and I believe everyone here does, you are a spirit being. You are a spirit being human. And you have a spirit. You are a spirit. And then the, the fruits of the Holy Spirit are things such as love, 
joy, peace, forbearance, gentleness. These things are qualities that don't depend on conditions. These things are who we are. And when everything else is, is, is moved away, that's what comes out. If you squish, if you press an orange, what do you get? Orange juice, its essence is released. If you squeeze a lemon, what do you get? Lemon juice, its essence is released. An apple is pressed, its essence is released. When we are pressed, our essence is released. And as both human and spirit, substance and spirit, we can be releasing the ego part of us, the part of us that may be identified with just me and mine and self and fear. That may come out and fight and scream. But if we fully express, as we begin to fully release ourselves, we will come to discover our core essence because our core essence is this being is light. And this instant is love. That at our core, we are light and we are love. Amen? Amen. At our core, we are light and we are love. That, my friends, is our saving grace. Because if that is true, if at our core we are light and love, then when the pressure gets so tense and so hard, eventually what has to rise to the surface is the essence of all that we are, and that is that light and love, and that is what is happening. So what is joy? Joy is a fruit of your spirit. Joy is a part of you. Joy never depends on conditions. Joy is always there. The scriptures have a lot to say about joy. A joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. Do not suffer, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. My strength is the joy of the Lord. That joy is a promise because it's a part of our nature. But you have to remember, joy is not happiness. You may be sad, you may be angry, you may be confused, and joy is still a part of your being. Joy is available. I'm not suggesting that there aren't going to be moments you look around and say, where did my joy go? You may have those moments, and they may last for a little while. But the thing is to hold on, to lift your spirit. You see, my definition is joy is a lifted spirit. That when we lift our spirit, we are lifted in spirit. When I lift my spirit, I am lifted in spirit. Would you say that with me? When I lift my spirit... I am lifted in spirit. And that's what joy is. Joy is a lifted spirit. And the willingness to keep lifting your spirit, lifting your spiritual awareness, lifting the truth, keep lifting that in the midst of whatever is showing up, to continue to lift that. And that keeps us connected to this joy, this joy and this peace that passes understanding. It's the fuel that we need right now. It's the taproot to our soul being fully expressed. That's what joy is. And so how do we find it? How do we get it? I Googled, just for curiosity, um, finding joy. Over 2.8 million things came up. Apparently, a lot of people are trying to find joy right now. <laughs> that finding joy in this and in that. Every imaginable thing and unimaginable thing. Finding joy. Well, finding joy is really a returning in your awareness first and foremost to I am spirit. I lift my spirit and spirit lifts me. I lift my spirit and spirit lifts me. So finding joy is first and foremost remembering who you are and remembering that promise. There's a story of a, a, a Zen student who said, life is hard, life is bitter. I don't like the way things are right now. It's full of pain. It's full of anger. It's full of bitterness. The young Zen student went to a Zen master and said, I need help. Life is, my life is just so hard and so bitter. I don't know how to deal with it. Teach me. The Zen master said, go and get a cup of salt and an empty cup, a cup of water. And he said, brought him forward and he said, take a pinch of salt and put it in your cup of water and now taste. And the student put a cup of, pinch of salt in the cup of water and tasted. The Zen master said, what does it taste like? And he said, well, it's bitter. It tastes like salt. I don't like it. And he said, come with me and bring the salt. And bring your cup. Emptied the cup. He brought him to the river that ran through the village. 
And he said, take the same amount of salt and drop it in this river. And now bend down and get a fresh cup of water and taste and tell me what you taste. And he said, it is refreshing. It is wonderful. It is, it is fresh water. And he said, everybody gets salt in life. Whether you become bitter depends on your container. That when life becomes bitter, your container has gotten too small. You've lost sense of who you are as a part of the great I am. You are trying to deal with everything as this little individual I, rather than remembering your true container, that you are a form and an expression of all that is. And to return your awareness to that container, to, to allow yourself to be contained and part of the great river of life, and that bitterness just begins to dissipate. And so it's learning to hold both of those. It's learning to be present that sometimes in your individual life there's hurt, there's pain, there's bitterness, and that calls us to feel it, to heal it. Do not try to perform a spiritual bypass. It will not work. I have tried. That you can't just jump over. You can't just Pollyanna-ish. You can't just bury it because it is buried alive. Begin. I've tried it. How many of you have tried it? It's buried alive. It will come up. That's what's coming up now is things our culture has buried alive. They're coming up to be, to be healed. And so to realize that in this individual cup, you're going to have these things. But to the degree that you identify, Jesus said, I am in the world. I'm in the world. I have my cup, but I am not of the world. I identify as the great I am. And knowing that makes all the difference in the world. It truly determines how you show up and what's possible for you, what's available to you, what you're capable of doing. Your whole life changes when you know that. And so what is joy? That's joy is your spirit, the fruit of the spirit. And how do we get it? We get it by identifying as a part of the great I am. Joy will show up in our life in, in many different ways. I was, uh, I'm going to read this again, what Jean shared, because Wednesday, you know, when I got up and I've been in prayer, this, this came through, I actually posted it on Facebook. This is what rose up in me, because part of what joy is, is passion. Today I rise and shine and stand on holy ground. I commit again this day to stand as an ambassador, advocate, and activist for the sanctity of all life. I am my brother's keeper. I am my sister's keeper. I am keeper of the earth and all sentient beings. I commit to turn up the volume of love, dignity, and respect for all. I commit to stand up and take loving action as needed. I will not become numb or disconnected or pretend I don't see harm or wrongdoing. I will not remain silent when love needs a voice. Not only do I proclaim a gospel of inclusivity and love, I am now actively involved in championing our emerging world of a beloved community. You see, when I couldn't feel joy exactly in a happy way, I could feel deep passion. And that passion led me to joy because I'm passionate about making a difference. I don't know what that's going to look like. I know I've started wearing a safety pin, as many of you have, because this means, this is a symbol now that says, I'm a safe place in the midst of everything that's going on. I am a safe connector. Your heart is safe with me. It's a powerful way to begin. You'll begin to see more and more people. And we happen to have some safety pins if you want one. <laughs> There's some in, in the back for you. So to realize that joy sometimes shows up as passion. It shows up in as an experience of the fullness of life. Recall those times when your life feels full. It feels good. There's joy there. Joy shows up in times of giggling and awe. You know, there's nothing more joyful than a child. Children are just naturally joyful. And just like the Dalai Lama, he's one of the most joyful people, but he's also deeply, he'll cry as quickly as he will giggle. He's deeply human and deeply spiritual. And so connect to what makes you giggle. Be spontaneous. Let joy have its way with you. And, and immerse yourself in awe. To look at the moon, look at the beautiful um, landscape that we have here. Just look around and soak it up and let that return you to joy. Comfort and compassion, to be surrounded by those whom I love and those who love me, to be held in common caring. 
we had a prayer service Wednesday night and it was so beautiful because many people came together and were held in common caring. You see, we get that on Sunday. We're held in common caring. We're part of a community that cares. And hopefully what happens is we take that caring and it becomes big enough for anybody and everybody that it's not about us and them. You hear that? We need to get rid of that language. It's, it's us. You know, I thought this also this week that as a, as a minister, as a, a church, I really appreciate the separation of church and state. And so this is never a place for uh, political speech. This is not red or blue. But when you blend red and blue, you get purple. And the most sacred color that we know is purple. The purple or the violet flame. Do you know what that stands for? Shout it out, somebody. Transformation. Transformation. The violet flame, purple, is for transmutation and transformation. I think it's purple time. <laughs> so we're going we're gonna, to gonna be that and, and hold that. So joy is all of these things. It's passion, fullness of life, giggles and awe, comfort and compassion, and then quiet serenity and, and emptiness, peace. Have you? I know you have. Cried and cried and cried until you had nothing left. You ever got to that point when you were completely empty? Completely empty. A feeling felt to completion will always return you to your essence. You see, our world needs, we need to express, we need to let it out that we may be returned to our essence. Our essence is love. Our essence is healing. Our essence is compassion. That's what is happening as we, if we can get ourselves empty. And even though it may not feel happy, there's great joy in that. That's the voice that says, it is well with my soul. Richard, would you give me that, um, that key, but very slowly right now. The final I want to share with you. So we've talked about what is joy and, and how do we find joy. We find it through an awareness of who we are and, and lifting our spirit. But then how do we keep joy? You remember that little song as a kid, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart, down in my heart, where? Down in my heart, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart, down in my heart to stay, stay. That may be a little bit of our problem, thank you. <laughs> down in our heart to stay. Well, we want to keep our joy, but it's down in our heart to give. You know, sometimes in life there's things we cherish and there may be a limited amount. I use the analogy of my partner from Seattle loves her mother's fudge. Her mom makes incredible chocolate fudge. Every time she comes back, she brings two little teeny tin. They look like little miniature um, lunch boxes from the old days. They're filled with fudge. The first day, she's very generous with that fudge. <laughs> the second day, perhaps. After a day or two, I can't find those little boxes. <laughs> and so I assume it's gone until I walk in the kitchen and she's like, I'm like Your teeth are brown and you smell like fudge, where is it? <laughs> You know, there's certain things that are like so precious, we just want to hold on to it. It's okay to hold on to your fudge. <laughs> but don't try to hold on to your joy. Give it away. You see, when it comes to these things of spirit, love is here to be expressed. And in the expressing, you become the channel. It just flows through you. There's no end. Joy is here to be expressed. As you spread joy, as you lift spirits, as you are generous, as you are kind, as you do these things, joy flows through you. The children of Israel in Exodus, we, we know the story of the children of Israel, the Hebrews being a mighty nation. And then as they begin to grow and, and, and outnumber the people of the land they were in, the people of that land begin to enslave them and what kept the children of Israel the Hebrew children going was music they would hide their harps and their lyres but at the end of the day they would go out they would gather by the river and they would play their music and they'd sing together 
They'd open their hearts and they would allow that joy to flow together. Because music, remember, if you know any of the scripture, that King Solomon, it's, the scriptures say his spirit was vexed. He was anxious. And he would call on David to play his harp, to soothe his spirit. So these were people that used music. They were very passionate. And they would use music to, to fuel their, lift their spirit. Well, finally... Charlton Heston as Moses appeared and the Red Sea split and you've seen, you've seen the movie how they, that happened and they get to the promised land but then life happens again and the Babylonians, the Assyrians they're taken over and that temple of Solomon is destroyed, their idols are desecrated and these people are captured again and they're taken to Babylon and so this is a recounting of this in, in the Psalms. The writer of Psalms said, By the rivers of Babylon we sat down, yea, and we wept when we remembered Jerusalem, our home. You see, the way they liked things, the way they knew things. We wept in a foreign land. And we hung our harps on the willows in the midst of them. You see, the Babylonian Valley, it was known as the Valley of Willows. Those long, droopy branches, the weeping willow. Well, there they were by the river, and they hung their harps in the trees. For those who carried us away captive, ask of us a song. And those who had plundered our temple into ruins, they requested mirth. They asked us, sing us one of your songs of Zion. We replied, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? You see, some many hearts are crying and saying, how can I possibly sing my song in our country now? How can I possibly sing my song in a trying time when, when I don't want to sing my song? I don't feel like singing my song. I'd rather leave my harp hanging in the willows. Can you relate a little bit? But it's at that time, what is needed more than anything is to pick up that harp. Because the message here is, you carry your home with you. You carry your joy with you. You carry your values, your spirit. You carry these things with you. It doesn't matter if you're in this land or that land. It doesn't matter if this person is president or that person is president. What really matters and what will make the difference is that we pick up our harps and we sing our songs. That we let our soul song of love and light and inclusivity. This is not a time to put the harp on the willow. This is a time to get it up and to sing. And so if I had to guess what they were singing, I think it was one of my old Pentecostal songs. <laughs> that went like this I'm pressing on the upward way a new heights I'm gaining every day still praying as I'm onward bound Lord Let me 
Yeah.